and welcome to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers. I'm here with a very special guest who I really want to take the time to introduce you to, Rob Zins. Rob, great to have you here, brother. Thank you, Larry. Good to be here again yes. with you. Now, a lot of people don't really know who you are, although I know I've known you for decades. But uh, just to let our YouTube viewers out there get a good idea who you are, I'd like you to take some time and explain the books you have written. Now, you are a former Roman Catholic, yet you graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. Right. In fact, I think your, uh, your degree is in history. Historical True. theology, right. Historical theology. So uh, with that said, and for the sake of our viewers who don't really know who you are, and there's going to be a lot of people like that, <laughs> I'd like you to kind of begin with some of the books you've written, some of the pamphlets, things that talk about your ministry, mm -hmm. maybe your website, and then I'll just throw in my two cents worth whenever I get a chance. Okay. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Larry. It's good to be here. Actually, after graduating from Dallas Seminary, it was my intention to go into the pastoral ministry and to become involved in local church work, which I think is probably what most of the uh, men who graduate from seminary want to do. But having been in the pastoral ministry for several years and, and having uh, come to some uh, idea through my studies about the great Protestant Reformation, I was concerned a little bit about the uh, disposition of evangelicals toward the Roman Catholic religion. Now, I was raised in the Roman Catholic religion and and, and went through catechism and confirmation and so forth. But uh, I, I left the Roman Catholic religion and was kind of free-floating and uh, ultimately came to Christ through reading the scriptures and, and having been witnessed to by some Christians uh, a little bit later on in life. And uh, after going to seminary and being a part of the pastoral ministry, I began to notice that there was a shift taking place in our nation that more and more evangelicals, more and more articles and books were written uh, favoring the Roman Catholic religion and sort of building this large tent and including not only Roman Catholicism but a number of other non-Christian religions under this tent. So I began looking around for books that may address this issue and there weren't too many books out there. And I came across one book in particular written in the early 50s by a man named Lorraine Bettner. And at that time, Dr. Bettner had written a standard work on the Roman Catholic religion, but it was outdated. And along about that same time, a Roman Catholic writer wrote a book, an apologetic book, wherein he set about to do what uh, the book says debunk Lorraine Bettner. In other words, to disprove all that Lorraine Bettner was saying about the Roman Catholic religion. You're so, talking about Carl Keating? Carl Keating, right. Mm -hmm. Carl Keating's book. So I read Keating's book uh, and, and read Bettner's book again, and I, I asked the question almost out loud, has anybody answered Keating? Now, he started Catholic Answers. He did. He started Catholic Answers in San Diego, and no one at that time had given a direct answer to Carl Keating. So I decided, well, Let's give it a try. And that's when I wrote my, uh, my very first book. And this book is entitled Romanism, The Relentless Roman Catholic Assault on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's a long title, Romanism, The Relentless Roman Catholic Assault on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's a purposeful title. This book goes through every single chapter of Carl Keating's work and analyzes the Roman Catholic position on virtually every aspect of their religion. We have in this book a chapter on baptism, penance, purgatory, the Eucharist, the Mass, the place of Peter invoking the dead, Mary, justification, the so-called charge of professional anti-Catholics, and a final chapter on the changing face of Rome due to Vatican II. So this book was written in response to a very strong Roman Catholic writer. Mm -hmm. And that actually began the ball rolling to have a, a more full-orbed, ongoing ministry to the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. community. But, as you know, in 1994, a statement came out called ECT, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, where a number of prominent evangelicals actually signed a document essentially endorsing the Roman Catholic religion. This document came as quite a shock to the evangelical community. It still has a rippling effect to our day, 
And I think I, it was signed by like Bill Bright of Bill Campus Bright, Crusade, Campus Crusade uh, J.I. Packer, uh, J.I. Packer, uh, um, a number of people. And that led me to write my second book. My second book is entitled On the Edge of Apostasy, subtitled The Evangelical Romance with Rome. This book is extremely important because we analyze the modern evangelical thought patterns of those who would want to convince us that the Roman Catholic religion is just another branch or form of Christianity. And uh, did a lot of research, it's well footnoted, and uh, I, I just spent a lot of time trying to answer the question, why would evangelicals ever think that the Roman Catholic religion is in fact a Christian religion and should be considered as an alternative worshiping community to Christianity? And having written this book, I got into all kinds of trouble because uh, it flies in the face of the modern uh, thinking mm -hmm. of ecumenism. Mm -hmm. So this deals with the ecumenical movement and a number of broad organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have it available for you on a number of okay, various websites. Uh, could you briefly mention a few of your other references before we... Yes, we realize that a lot of people don't like to read long books, so we've written <laughs> short books. And this booklet right here is a, a book that we've sent all over the world. It's entitled Salvation by Grace Through Faith Alone or by Grace Through Sacraments. And this is a very uh, concise analysis of the Roman Catholic sacramental system. And it's not too hard to read, it's not too long, it's direct, and we think we hit the point very well. But for those who like to read booklets, <laughs> we have written a tiny little booklet that we do send out a lot. It's called, I'm a Christian, you are a Roman Catholic, so what is the big deal? And this also has been translated into Spanish as well. And uh, I like to remind you that uh, we do send these booklets over to Spanish speaking nations and people. In fact, we made, a, we made a Spanish video out yeah. of that and it is yeah, on it. YouTube. Yeah, it the, is on the audio YouTube. is on YouTube. Right. So between the, the larger works, the medium works, and the smaller works, this is a sampling of the kinds of things that we use uh, to help Roman Catholics understand their own religion and also to help evangelicals understand the Roman Catholic religion. And in doing so, I think you'll, you'll have to agree at the end of the day that the Roman Catholic religion is a religion unto itself and uh, uses, in some cases, many Christian terms, but defines them with a completely non-Christian dictionary. That's the way well, I like to say it. I would like to mention also that uh, for those of you out there that uh, may not be familiar with our, uh, uh, our YouTube channel page, See Answers TV, you're seeing it right now on your screen. But uh, you may not have noticed that if you look at our channel page and you go down a little bit, on the page, you'll find that we list several websites, BibleQuery.org, MuslimHope.com, uh, HistoryCart.com, BereanBeacon.org, PilgrimPublications.com. And then there's one right under, after that called CWRC-RZ.org. Now, does that sound familiar to you, Rob? It certainly does. That's our website, uh, Larry, cwrc rz rz.org and if you come to our website and scroll through it there are tons of articles and information on how you can get these books and pamphlets and we'd uh, love to hear from you you can email me and uh, order anything you want off the website yeah, i'd also like to mention to our viewers that if you're on our channel page you'll notice we have 19 playlists that go down the right hand side of the page on all kinds of subjects third one down is on jehovah's witnesses and mormons and and uh, Seventh-day Adventists and so forth. But as you get way down in there, you, you find Roman Catholicism. As you're seeing on the screen, this is our playlist on Roman Catholicism. At the time we did this video, it was we had 79 videos. We've got more now But uh, by the time you're seeing this. But uh, as you're looking at this, uh, you see that we have... Uh, all these videos, and Rob is in quite a few of these videos. Mm. Rob, as the people are looking at this, they, they see here that uh, there's a Boston College debate. And what happened in that particular video, for instance? Well, the Boston College debate was a, a debate that uh, centered around the authority of the Pope at Rome. Essentially, it was our duty and, and privilege to debate two Roman Catholic scholars on stage at Boston College, and they presented the Roman Catholic uh, persuasion on the Pope at Rome, who's considered in their religion to be the vicar of Christ on earth, and 
we did everything we could to refute their understanding and also to present the, the biblical Christian understanding of the person of Peter. So that, that's the, the very kind of thing that we do, and we have it on videotape. And anybody who's interested in the difference between what a Roman Catholic scholar would present about their own religion and about the Pope at Rome, and the contrasting view, the antithetical view, actually the opposite view of biblical Christianity, that would be a good debate to watch. Right, and I wanted to mention on our playlist, we have our 16-hour video series with Rob and me that we did like 20 years ago. Right. Uh, but that covers uh, the, the whole orb of all the teachings and doctrines of the Roman Catholic religion. And then we've got all kinds of other videos that Rob and me have done as well. Your debate with the Monsignor, right. for instance, that was most interesting. He was basically saying you can believe anything yeah. and it doesn't really matter. I'm letting uh, everyone know that we have many, many videos. One last thing I want to say is if you type Rob Zins, that's R-O-B, Z-I-N-S, into the YouTube search box, you'll get a whole plethora of Rob Zinn videos that are available on YouTube. And if you were to type Rob Zinn's Romanism, once again, you'll get even more Rob Zinn's videos <laughs> in a plethora of uh, videos available. And as you can see these things, there's just some samples there on your screen. But uh, with that said, we just wanted to call your attention to all the resources that are available through this brother in Christ here, former Roman Catholic, who was saved by a supernatural act of God. That's really the difference in a real Christian who has been born again, John 3, 3 through 8, through a work of the, the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit over just getting baptized or, or doing all these sacraments or things of that nature. We're talking about what makes you a real Christian is a supernatural act of God on your behalf where before you were dead in your sins and trespasses. Yeah. Behold, now you're alive in Christ. And that's really what changed your life. Amen. All right, okay. brother, with that said, uh, we're going to go into, this is just a promo leading into a main video. So uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, little information uh, situation for discussing Rob. And I uh, hope you enjoy the video to come. God bless you all. Today I'm joined in studio by my very special guest, Rob Zins, who's written several books on Roman Catholicism and was a Roman Catholic himself. Uh, Rob, great to have you here. Thanks, Ray. Good to be back with you. Right. As you know, we're doing a special series of programs, sort of like little snippets leading into uh, older shows we've done in the past where we really get into a, a Roman Catholic doctrine in detail to contrast it to biblical truth, you might say. Right. Uh, this particular uh, snippet we're doing here, I'd like you to talk about the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Pope. I mean, we're always hearing about Matthew chapter 16, uh, Peter was the first Pope, and, and that's why the Roman Catholic Church is true, because there's been this succession of Popes down through time, and that what, that's what makes it the, the one true church. Right. Could you address that issue for, your, for a few minutes, and uh, we'll take it from there. Right. It's Roman Catholic uh, doctrine and position that Peter was the first Pope and that he resided at Rome or at least had a ministry at Rome and was martyred at Rome. But uh, out of the New Testament, they surmised that he was invested with uh, a certain amount of authority to make him elevated to be the greatest of all of the apostles. And this elevation of Peter and this recognition in the Roman Catholic religion of Peter's primacy, a position of primacy, has carried on throughout the centuries. And of course, it goes to the point of Rome believing that Jesus Christ left uh, for us a consolidated church with one supreme leader at the top. And uh, 
Rome, Rome comes forward and says, when Peter died, uh, he left his authority and, and his supremacy to his successor, and this is called apostolic succession. They gather this data uh, from a, a, a loose, loosely based understanding of their own history as well as biblical exegesis. They really believe that uh, when, when Jesus said to Peter, uh, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church, that Jesus was actually saying to Peter, you will be the greatest of all the apostles. You will have authority over the other apostles. You will have supremacy over the entire church, and upon you I'll build my church. Well, it flies in the face of Roman Catholic teaching and history as well. Uh, many Roman Catholic theologians do not hold that uh, Peter in that passage was being proclaimed the supreme pontiff, the vicar of Christ on earth. But Christian exegesis, those of us who come to the scriptures and we uh, do uh, an analysis of this passage and others, uh, have come to realize that even if Jesus Christ was in some way establishing Peter as prominent among the apostles, and we see this work out uh, early on in the book of Acts, there is no possibility that he was bestowing upon Peter all of this authority and making him the so-called vicar of Christ on earth and giving him the authority to pass his authority on to his successor, so forth and so on. So it's a long trail of uh, biblical and historical interpretation that the Roman Catholic theologians have pieced together. And it wasn't until Vatican I that the Roman Catholic religions bestowed upon their pope this whole concept of infallibility and one who speaks out of the chair of Peter and so forth and so on. And that's what we want to get into. You're, you're talking about the, the, the Vatican I in 1870, the infallibility of the pope? Yeah, Vatican I. Uh, yeah. We're talking about the, the progress of investing into mm -hmm. the Pope at Rome, the Bishop of Rome, all this authority culminating in the, uh, the uh, Vatican proclamation, Vatican I proclamation, mm -hmm. that Peter uh, was infallible when he spoke in matters of faith and morals, and that all those who succeed him are equally infallible when they speak in matters of faith and morals. And of course, the, there's none of, none of this taught in the scriptures. It's, it's completely against right. uh, a, anything that you could find. So Roman Catholic theologians go outside of scripture and try to prove it through a flow of history. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you do that sort of thing, you're outside of the scriptures and that's a dangerous place to be. That's right. Now, uh, the reformers in the Protestant Reformation, such as uh, John Calvin, Martin Luther, Zwingli, Knox, uh, they didn't have a very high opinion of the Pope. Did they? Uh, they felt like it was outside the scripture as well. And if my, if my memory serves me correct, a lot of the uh, original Protestant uh, uh, confessions of faith and so forth declared the Pope to be the Antichrist. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it was common during the Protestant Reformation during a period of time when, when, when these early reformers and, and even the ones who followed them, when they spoke about the Pope at Rome, they really believed. And to some extent, they're absolutely correct that this is not the vicar of Christ, much closer to Antichrist because of the power that he assumed, because of the corruption, because of the, 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 the absolute authoritarian dictatorial figure that he struck. He's even claiming that one of his titles is Holy Father. Yeah. Yeah. Even that's a blasphemous yeah. time. And Larry, if you think that this is all ancient history, all we have to do is look at the modern catechism. Mm -hmm. And the modern catechism states clearly that the Pope at Rome can exercise his authority over the entire church unhindered. Mm -hmm. Supreme authority, unhindered. And so you find obviously, nothing like that in the Bible oh, at all. Uh, at all. Yeah. What we're dealing well, with is a different religion. Well, yeah. with that, uh, people are wel welcome to watch a video that... Rob and me did on this very subject. It's an hour long or so, uh, 20 years ago. And that's coming up right after this. So stay with us. God bless. We're going to start moving now into the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Pope. But to kind of set the table, we'll kind of move through the, I guess, the hierarchy of, of Roman Catholicism that leads to the Pope. And this chart we have now gets a little into uh, the priesthood. And what is a priest? Uh, almost every Catholic parish has a, a local priest there. And 
And then those priests have someone over them and someone over them, and it eventually leads to the Pope. Well, what we want to look at here briefly as we move into uh, the doctrine of the Pope it itself, uh, we want to look at how is the priest defined, and then with an understanding of this, we start to get a better understanding what it means as you move higher up in the Roman Catholic hierarchy. I mean, if a, a lowly priest would have these titles, what would it mean for the top man? Yeah, it's something to think about it, it, uh, when you consider these things. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Rob, I'll let you take over here. We've got actual quotes and things uh, from Roman Catholic sources. And uh, we have on this first, this number one point here, we have the priest defined, mm -hmm. coming from the instruction in the Catholic faith, page 110. Would you like to read that and uh, okay. continue to expound? Before we move to this chart, just let me say that if we could, if we could have a pyramid in our minds, it would, that's the best way to understand the Roman Catholic religious system and the order of that system. Mm -hmm. On the bottom, the base of that pyramid will be what we would call Catholics, rank and file Catholics, those who are in the Catholic religion, those who go to Catholic Church, those who attend Mass. And then above that base, there would be what we call the religious. These are monastery type people, the monks in the monasteries, those who work in hospitals, those who are involved in Roman Catholic social services and things like that. They are the religious. So there's a rank and file Catholic, then there is the religious, and then above the religious is something they call the priest. And that's what you have here on the chart. The priest is the man, no woman can be a priest, who has been given the sacrament of holy orders. Now this is one of the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church whereby they separate their men unto a special class and call them priests. And as you can see on the chart here, a priest defined, a priest is a man who primarily offers sacrifice to God for the sins of the people. There have always been priests both in the true religion and in the false religions even in the pagan religions. Why? Because people have always felt the need of having someone to offer sacrifice to Almighty God for their sins. Now this is from the instruction in the Catholic faith and it, it defines their idea of what a priest should be. Somebody who offers sacrifices, somebody who stands in their place before God. Mm -hmm. uh, quote number two here to sum up a few brief sentences. The titles of a Catholic priest, he is called a king, he is called a shepherd because he leads his flock into the delicious pastures of the sacraments and shelters them from the wolves that lie in wait for their souls. He is the father because he breaks the bread of life to his spiritual children whom he has begotten in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So the priest takes on this position of being one who stands between the Catholic and the religious and God. Now, we go on to see that he is not only that, but he is a judge whose office it is to pass sentence of pardon on self-accusing criminals. He is a physician because he heals their souls from the loathem distempers of sin. This is all taken from Faith of Our Fathers, page 391. The priest is called a mediator between God and man out of the Baltimore Catechism. The priest enters the scene sent by God to fulfill the anguished need of men he is present in the church always. He is, with the Holy Spirit, the enduring source of her life. This is a, a citation from a cardinal. A priest is a man drawn from the ranks of the people of God to be made in the very depths of his being like to Christ, the priest of mankind. This is a doctrine out of Vatican II. So you can see the Vatican II has changed nothing insofar as defining a priest. And finally, thus priests, are gods in power, power and dignity of the priesthood which surpasses all the powers of heaven and earth, second only to the ineffable dignity of the mother of God. And this is a quote here from the priest, his dignity and obligations. The whole idea is that the priest is a, is a man who stands in the place of uh, the rank and file Roman Catholic and he performs sacrificial acts, acts as a father, acts as a confessor, has authority to forgive sins, and uh, really is a part of the heart of the Roman Catholic hierarchical system. So what's after a priest then? You're well, talking about hierarchy. Hierarchy, right. So now if we keep going up the, the pyramid here, 
Having said all that about priests, the next step are what we call special priests. And these priests are given the title of bishops in the Roman Catholic religion. Bishops are men chosen by the, uh, the, uh, the people over them to be in charge of a, uh, a particular group of priests. And above the bishop would be the archbishop, who would be in charge of uh, a group of bishops. And then, of course, above the archbishop would be another group of people called cardinals. Cardinals are mainly servants of the pope. They are stationed uh, at the Vatican, and their job is to oversee the archbishop and the archbishop oversees the bishop, and the bishop oversees the priest, the priest oversees the, the people, the Roman Catholic rank and Now, power. they all started as priests, though, somewhere along the line, and worked right. their way up. Is that how it goes? Yes. Uh, the worthy priest qualifies as a bishop. He's appointed. The worthy bishop qualifies as an archbishop, mm. and uh, the worthy archbishop qualifies as cardinal. Now, from the sea of cardinals will come one in the Roman Catholic religion, who will be called the vicar of Christ on earth, and that is none other than the pope himself. So this is the hierarchy. The pope is elected by how do, the... How do, they, how do they elect him? Well, good question. We read in the Catholic Almanac of 1990 the procedure for the election of the pope, where I read on page 320, the Pope is elected by members of the College of Cardinals in a secret conclave or meeting convened ordinarily in secluded quarters of the Vatican Palace between 15 and 20 days after the death of his predecessor. Cardinals under the age of 80, totaling no more than 120, are eligible to participate in a papal election. Following are some of the principal regulations decreed by Paul VI in 1975. The ordinary manner of election is by scrutiny, with two votes each morning and afternoon in the Sistine Chapel until one of the candidates receives a two-thirds plus one vote majority. And then it goes on to uh, alternative ways of electing a pope, but suffice to say that mm -hmm. A select group of cardinals, no more than 120, operating under the, uh, the secluded uh, conclave secret meeting, elect the next pope within 15 days after the uh, death of his predecessor. And that gives you an overview of the, uh, the hierarchical system of the Roman Catholic religion. I see. Well, that was a good coverage of the, uh, the hierarchy. So now we've arrived at the Pope. We have. We've arrived at the Pope, and uh, we need to find out now what is, what is the doctrine of the Pope? What does it mean? Uh, who is this guy? You know, <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's the question. Uh, well, we've got another chart up on the, the, the board here, and we'll take a look at some official Catholic statements. Uh, I think we need to uh, preface this, this chart, though, with uh, the idea that the Pope basically is considered the successor of Peter. Uh, Peter, I think in Roman Catholic doctrine, is considered the first Pope. Right. Uh, and when Peter died, he was succeeded by someone who took his mantle, so to speak, and became the next Pope. Right. And then so forth down through time. Pope after Pope after Pope, uh, apparently having some kind of authority that was transferred from the Apostle Peter himself. Mm. Does, uh, do you have anything to add to that, brother? Right. I think that in order to understand the, the position of the Pope and the authority of the Pope in the Roman Catholic religion, you have to begin with the outrageous claims that the Roman Catholic religion makes for and on behalf of Peter claims that Peter would never have made himself and claims which cannot be substantiated either by the authority of Scripture or by the testimony of history. So we begin with Peter. That's really our starting point. Rome claims that Jesus Christ, prior to his death, resurrection, and ascension, conferred upon Peter special primacy, special authority, 
lifted him up and made him the primary apostle, having authority and final say over the other apostles. They do that. That's the first thing that has to happen. The second thing that has to happen is they must get Peter in Rome. Okay, they have to find Peter having his way at Rome and having primacy in the city of Rome. The third thing which must happen is that they must convince themselves and all those who follow their religion that Peter not only had all this power and authority, but he passed it along to his successor, which is called apostolic succession. Which gives them a lot of authority if it's true. Absolutely. If you can prove that Peter had all of this authority, that's one thing. If you can then prove that Peter passed it along, that's another thing. And then, of course, you're left with the final proof that Peter did all of this from Rome, hence the Bishop of Rome is the primary recipient of the passing on of apostolic authority. Now, all of these are outlandish and outrageous claims. But we'll, and we'll get to and that. And we sure will. We'll get to that. As a, we uh, need to get that in, though, yeah, to let, let people have an understanding right. then how this pope came about in that it's uh, some kind of apostolic succession of authority from God himself given to this head man, which then gives authority to the whole hierarchy, which gives uh, credibility to the church itself, the Roman Catholic right. Church. Really, the whole issue is... Uh, whether or not Peter is a pope. I say exactly. no. I say absolutely not. Now, wait not. a minute. Now, if Peter was not a pope and there was no apostolic secession, what would this do then to the Roman Catholic Church and their hierarchy? It would absolutely crumble in the dust, which is where it belongs. For it is built upon surmisals. It is built upon speculative theology. It is built upon a hierarchical system that continues to feed itself and it has absolutely no basis. Let me be positive of this. It has no basis in scriptures for these outlandish claims that it is making. It's sort of, it kind of reminds me of, uh, you can take a modern day figure like uh, Reverend Sun Yun Moon. He says he's the second coming of Christ. And, uh, you know, if you want to get right with God and everything, you better believe he's the re return of Jesus in the flesh and you have to, you know, but he's making a statement. He's making yes. claims that Jesus appeared to him in 1934 in a hillside in Korea right. and told him to go out and, and, and bring this message. And you can go, uh, Joseph Smith, Jr. of the Mormons, he said right. that God and Jesus Christ came down to him in a pillar of light and told him, well, we need this true gospel spread and you're the man to do it. In other words, there's religion after religion after religion that is making claims for itself. Right in claiming they have the authority to be the true religion. Mm -hmm. But it always comes back down though, there's so many religions all claiming this authority and usually using Jesus' name somewhere in there as part of that authority. Okay. What's the yardstick? How do you tell them apart? Uh, do you have an answer for that? I do. You tell them apart by virtue of what saith the word. You see, as, as, a, as a biblical Christian, my sole source of authority is the Word of God. If a claimant comes along and claims this, that, or the other thing, I'm going to examine it by the Word of God. I'm going to see if it measures up by the Word of God. And is it not a mark of a cult? You've done many fine shows on the cults. Is it not a mark of a cult that one person is raised up and said to have received from God special powers, special authorities, and in receiving these, he is to be revered and honored and given a place of authority and followed by men. Well, that's a definite pattern of the cults. You see Absolutely. one cultic system after another. It's that, that pattern of giving someone authority, either one man or a group of individuals who suddenly have more information than everybody else. Right. And if you don't listen to them, you, you know, you're anathema, you're, you're, you're doomed. Uh, and it's just a clear-cut pattern that you see. Anyone that studies comparative religions will see this pattern. Right. It, it goes without saying. Absolutely. So basically, the only way you can really tell, especially if they're claiming to be Christians, I mean, we're talking about people that claim the authority of Jesus Christ. Well, then it comes back right down to it. 
what saith the scripture? Well, how do we know what we know about Jesus? It's in the Bible. Absolutely. So, how do we know if they're telling us the truth about what Jesus said or things of this nature? Well, we have to use the Bible as the measure, measuring rod to test what they're saying. Mm -hmm. if and, it's this, true it, or not. and this is what is so frustrating. Uh, my dear Catholic friends, if you're out there and you're watching this program, I appeal to you on the basis of your own reverence for the scriptures. Your own religion teaches you that the Bible is a source of authority, that the Bible is the very words of God inscripturated for us, for you, for the benefit of understanding God and Jesus Christ. And I appeal to you to search it, to listen to what we're saying today. Open it up. If you blindly accept the reasoning of a man without ever investigating for yourself, then you have denied the privilege that Christ has given to you to seek him in the scriptures. And this is what is so frustrating, is that I want Roman Catholics worldwide to understand that they can take their own Bible, the Roman Catholic Bible, which I have a copy of right here, and open it up and find out if that which we are saying is true or false. Mm -hmm. And you ask yourself if Peter was a pope, the very first pope, and all that is claimed for successive popes can be substantiated from this word. That's the challenge. That's a very good point. Now, uh, with that said, I think we need to move into a, a major doctrine here, as we have on the chart. Mm. Uh, basically, we, we saw all those things about the priest. And if you notice, as I did, that the priest is like a king, the shepherd. Uh, he, he looks over people's souls and all that kind of stuff which were obvious references to the same titles that Jesus has. I think it's in Roman Catholic doctrine that he's another Christos, mm. an, another Christ, mm. the priest. Right. So obviously the Pope, who is the most exalted of all the priests, would probably have pretty high credentials when already the, 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 the low echelon priests are already taking names of Christ according to the Roman Catholic dogma. Mm. Now that leads us to an interesting doctrine concerning uh, the Roman Catholic Pope. And here it is on the chart, folks, if you can see it. Uh, the question, is the Pope infallible? Now, well, something we haven't mentioned up to this point, because we're going to bring all this together, is that in Roman Catholic dogma, there's something known as infallibility of the Pope, mm. that he uh, speaks ex cathedra or something of that mm -hmm. from the chair, and mm -hmm. it's infallible. He can't make a mistake concerning morals or or, or uh, uh, faith and morals. I right, faith and morals. Which is pretty vague, if you ask mm -hmm. me. I mean, almost anything you say would pertain to something of that nature, I would mm -hmm. think. But uh, what we need to do then is tie in this infallibility with the vicar of Christ, the, the supremacy of Peter, or, or the primacy of Peter, in that apostolic succession we were just talking about. And what we're going to do now in these charts is, is go through that infallibility question. Mm -hmm. Is Peter the first pope? apostolic succession, and all those things. We're going to try to tie it all together for you and see what we can find out. But of course, the key to it all is what does the Roman Catholic Church say about these things? Mm -hmm. Establish that first. We don't want you just thinking we're making this stuff up and then go from there. Right. Well, Rob, we've got some, uh, we've got some statements by uh, official uh, Roman Catholic uh, authorities. Could you go ahead and start showing our viewers this stuff? Right. Lest you think we're building a straw man in order to blow them away, we're not. This is actual teaching of the Roman Catholic religion. From the New York Catechism we hear, or we can read, the Pope takes the place of Jesus Christ on earth. By the divine right, the Pope has supreme and full power in faith and morals over each and every pastor and his flock. He is the true vicar of Christ, the head of the entire church, the father and teacher of all Christians. He is the infallible ruler, the founder of dogmas, the author of and the judge of councils, the universal ruler of truth, the arbiter of the world, the supreme judge of heaven and earth, the judge of all being judged by no one, God himself on earth. Now I ask you, could anything be more clear insofar as the Roman Catholic's religion claim for one man to be the vicar of Christ, the supreme and full power, the ruler of 
the entire church. Let me ask you, what does that word vicar mean? So some of the people out there, are, vicar, what does that stand vicar, for? Vicar, that comes from vicarious. That means in the place of Christ. That means that he is the stand-in for Christ. As long as Christ is in heaven, according to the Roman Catholic religion, when the Pope speaks, it is Christ speaking concerning this issue of faith and morals. When the Pope speaks, it is Christ speaking. Well, that, makes, that ties in then with this last statement here. Being judged by no one, God himself on earth. That's correct. That's pretty... That's we're strong. talking about the, uh, yeah, that's pretty strong. I think uh, from looking at the definitions of the, the, the lower echelon priests, we're <laughs> moving up now to the top man being God himself on earth. Right. That uh, that's, is uh, that's pretty exalted, I think. Well, let's look at Vatican I. If any, and this really, Vatican I was uh, absolutely dogmatic in the formulation of the authority of the Pope. If anyone says that the blessed apostle Peter was not constituted by Christ our Lord Prince of all the apostles and visible head of all the church militant or that he, Peter, directly and immediately received from our Lord Jesus Christ a primacy of favor only and not one of true and proper jurisdiction, let him be accursed, let him be anathema. What this quote says here is that we're not we're not as Roman Catholics saying that Peter just had a, a position of favor and primacy. We're talking about absolute jurisdiction, absolute authority. In the Unum Sanctum Bull of Boniface VIII, we declare, affirm, uh, define, and pronounce it to be necessary to salvation for every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. This language... Uh, we can't make any stronger, and I think it continues mm -hmm. on and on, on the chart, uh, as far as the Roman Catholic religion's understanding of the authority of the Very Pope. well said. We have another quote from Cardinal Gibbons here, but we won't read it, but you're getting the point. We've got the book here. You can get it at any Catholic bookstore uh, from Cardinal, The Faith of Our Fathers. And uh, he goes on to just reaffirm, basically, Everything what Rob has been saying quite uh, clearly here, I think, from this chart already. With that said, brother, let's move on to the other side of the chart and uh, take a look at uh, a last couple of quotes here. Would you, you're doing a fine job. Well, let's hear what uh, Pope Pius IX has to say and then move into the most recent here, Vatican II. Yes, this is a statement from uh, a pope himself. I alone, despite my unworthiness, am the successor of the apostles the vicar of Jesus Christ. I alone have the vision to guide and direct the bark, the bark of Peter, that is the ship of Peter, the ship of state. I am the way, the truth, and the life. They who are with me are with the church. They who are not with me are out of the church. Notice this uh, use of I am the way, the truth, and the life, a direct uh, quotation of, 14, of what, P, uh, what Christ reserved for himself alone, exactly. taken upon by Pope Pius IX. Vatican II, uh, for those of you who are uh, perhaps hiding behind the shield of uh, Vatican II, saying that Vatican II softened all of this, that Vatican II changed our doctrine, we really don't have to hold to that. Uh, to be a Catholic, we can ignore all those previous statements, and, and you may be a Catholic out there today that says, well, I don't think the Pope has all that much authority. Well, you're questioning your own religion, and that's good, but you're also in defiance of that which you hold to be the true faith. And this quote right here is from Vatican II. In virtue of his office, the Roman pontiff, head of the College of Bishops, enjoys the infallibility, i.e. willed by Christ, when he makes a definite pronouncement of doctrine on faith or morals. Notice, he enjoys infallibility. As the supreme pastor and teacher of all the faithful who strengthens his brethren in faith, his definitions deserve, in consequence, to be called unalterable of themselves and not by reason of the church agreement, for they are delivered with the Holy Spirit's assistance, which was promised to him in the person of Peter. Consequently, they stand in no need of approval on the part of others, and they admit of no appeal to another court. The Pope has the final say. That's right. The absolute and 
final say. Couldn't be more clear from Vatican II. And especially when you know all the history that leads up to it and all the other dogmatic statements. Uh, well, Brother Time is flying on us here a lot quicker than we, we realize. So what we're going to have to do here is in a brief way go through some of these Roman Catholic proof texts and uh, offer our viewers a chance to call or write uh, you know, for more information on these things. Uh, with the time we have left, uh, we can't go into as much detail as we like because we still have plenty of material to show you. But, uh, uh, Rob, what we have here are some proof texts that the Roman Catholic Church uses to say that they have that apostolic succession, the, the primacy of Peter, and how that's been passed down by authority from Pope to Pope to Pope. They use Matthew chapter 16 on the chart here, verses 15 through mm -hmm. 19, about uh, you know, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and, and, and then Jesus replied to him, mm -hmm. uh, on this rock I'll build my church. Mm -hmm. And he goes on about the keys. People at home, get your Bible, check these references out. They also use Matthew 7, 25, about the house founded on a rock. John 21, 15 through 17, feed my sheep. And of course, Luke 22, 31 through 32, confirm my brethren. Uh, what would you like to say about some of this, brother? Okay, what I'd like, to, what I think I, uh, what might be helpful to the uh, audience out there, is for you to go back to my original statement. Was Peter a pope? All that the Roman Catholic religion says about a pope today must be proven for Peter, or else there is no pope. There is no apostolic succession. And I want to review with you from the scriptures, and I'll use the Roman Catholic Bible, what the Bible has to say about the person of Peter. Was he the vicar of Christ on earth? Did he ever say that he was the vicar of Christ on earth? Did he ever appeal to his authority? Was he granted this type of authority in scripture? Did the other apostles, the other bishops, elevate him as being higher than them. If it can be proven from Scripture that Peter was a pope, then perhaps we would have a starting point with the Roman Catholic religion. But as uh, I hope to point out, it cannot be substantiated from Scripture. In fact, quite the contrary. We begin our inquiry into the uh, life of Peter by arriving at an understanding of another apostle that of the Apostle Paul. How would Paul view Peter? Would he view him as a pope, as having the greatest of authority? The answer to that is no, for we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, Paul's writing, he says, I am become foolish. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended by you. For I have no way come short of them that are above measure apostles, although I be nothing. Paul says, I have not come short of any of them. He places himself on an equal footing with all of the apostles, Peter included. As a matter of fact, there is a run-in between these two Galatians, preachers of Galatians the gospel. Galatians chapter 2. Absolutely. In Galatians chapter 2, we read of a run-in between Peter and Paul. And as it turns out, Peter was being unfaithful to the gospel. Peter was hiding the ham sandwich behind his back, so to speak. And in so doing, he was chastised by Paul. And Paul stood up to him and had to tell him that he was compromising the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, how could one who is the vicar of Christ, the supreme authority, all that is impacted into Peter from the Catholic religion, how could he be in such grave error as in compromising the gospel? Again, Acts chapter 15, another reference, big council at Jerusalem pertaining to circumcision, pertaining to the works of the law, pertaining to the Mosaic law as it might be incumbent upon New Covenant believers. The council meets. Who stands up? Who leads the council? Who makes the proclamation? Was it Peter? No. It was James. James stood up and had the authority at the Council of Jerusalem. So we can see that from these passages of Scripture that Peter was not recognized by the other apostles as being above them at all. As a matter of fact, it was James and the others in Jerusalem that sent out Peter and that sent out Paul. 
clearly he is one among equals. Well, when you go to like Acts 126, they cast Lot for, for another apostle instead of a, an appointment by Peter. Peter didn't make the decision on who was going to be the next apostle. They just cast lots. Acts chapter 1 verse 26. Precisely. A Roman Catholic apologist liked to argue this point that Peter was the one who chose the successor when Judas hung himself. Mm -hmm. Not so. If you read the text carefully, Peter did so only on the basis of the Old Testament prophetic word which required it, thus meaning that the first, quote, pope was under the authority of the scriptures mm -hmm. and also this appointment was made in, in concert with the others and it was based upon a criteria that Christ had left. I also wanted to mention uh, verses that our viewers could uh, write down quickly here and then uh, check them for yourselves. Our time is running out so I don't have time to go through it all but Mark chapter 9 verses 33 through 35, Mark chapter 10 verses 35 through 44, Matthew chapter 23 verses 4 through 10. Uh, all these references you, you find that the, none of the people there recognize Peter as a pope. Uh, I think, uh, who was it? James and John, they were fighting over who was going to be on the right and left hand side of mm -hmm. Jesus. All this took place after Matthew 16 and, and so forth. So for viewers at home, I, you know, these are things to consider. There is much more we could say, but we've still got a lot of charts to go through <laughs> and I want to get them in before the show runs out. But uh, check those verses out, see for yourself. Yes, and, and it may be helpful for you also to to read the words of Peter himself. Just read the first uh, five verses of 1 Peter chapter 5 where we, we have a, a recommendation from Peter as to how uh, leaders in the church should conduct themselves. And he calls himself a fellow elder, one among them, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5. In fact, uh, if our viewers can check out this chart here on the lower part of it, we've got Peter never claims, or never claims supremacy. And look up your verses. Uh, 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, you know, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside at, as aliens scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia. He mentioned several places, Asia, but never Rome, who are chosen. Uh, you just mentioned 1 Peter 5, 1 through uh, 5. He mentions that he's just uh, a fellow elder uh, with the, mm -hmm. the others. And then, of course, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. He goes on in a lengthy dialogue here about how Jesus is the stone of stumbling, the, the ones that the builders rejected. And now, looking at this chart, we want to proceed with haste. We have at the top here, Christ himself is the head and foundation. What we are denying, Rob, is that Peter is the first pope, the head of the church, the foundation of the church, the rock of the church. Mm. Uh, a, a, God is mentioned as a rock over 34 times in the Old Testament. It's a term for God. Jesus, we know, is the second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh. But if we go through these references, Ephesians 1, Colossians 1, John 10, 1 Peter 5, 4, Ephesians 2, 20, 1 Corinthians 3, 11, Hebrews 3, 5 through 6, we find, just, just to mention a, a couple of them here, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 23 through 23, and he put all things in subjection under his feet. Whose feet? Jesus' feet. Mm -hmm. And gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Colossians 1.18, he is also head of the body of the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place mm -hmm. in everything. And John 10, I am the good shepherd. And it could go on and on. Right. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the foundation. Jesus is the cornerstone. Right. Now, the, the, of course, the Roman Catholic Church and religion and, and their, their entire system would not deny this. And this is what is so important for you to understand. The Roman Catholic religion does not deny that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. What they are unwilling to admit is that there is, there is not a shred of proof of evidence that Christ transferred that headship to Peter here on earth and Peter continued to transfer it at his death to his successor, on and on it goes. And uh, I suppose that we should say at least one word about the, the, the most famous passage, and that is uh, uh, Matthew chapter 16, which is the single solitary passage of Scripture that the Roman Catholic theologians appeal to. And uh, I just want to read it quickly. Um, the conversation between our Lord and 
Peter, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said to them, But whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Just let me say briefly that the question revolves around whether or not Peter is the rock that Christ is referring to in this passage. Roman Catholic theologians unanimously, yes, Peter is the rock. The uh, Protestant theologians are split on the issue whether Peter is the rock here. But that is not the most important question of the text. The most important question of the text is, if Peter is the rock, is it for Peter alone in his primacy in, in advocating and preaching the gospel, or is it passed on? To others, and that becomes a major issue. And perhaps sometime we could have a, a, a special program just on some of these passages, so we can so we can pace out the Roman Catholic right. reasoning from these passages exactly. and show where they are not to be trusted in their exegesis and in their conclusion mm -hmm. of this passage. And I know we don't have time to yeah, do not, that now. Not in but this that program, is, unfortunately, right. our but time we, uh, is flying. And I do want to go to the testimony of history and experience. In a, in a machine gun fashion here mm. as time flies. We're going to go rapidly through our remaining charts to uh, uh, just, just take a look at the question, the Pope is not infallible from our perspective. Mm. Uh, here we go. I'm just going to read right through them. How can a mere man be infallible? Is that not a prerogative of God alone? Were the popes infallible when they ordered Europe to exterminate the Muslims in the medieval crusades promising heaven to all who died fighting the infidels? How could Pope Liberius, A.D. 352-366, be called infallible when we know that he subscribed to an heretical Arian creed, that's to deny that Jesus is God, and broke communion with Athanasius, the great defender of the Nicene Creed? Is, a, is the Roman Catholics claim that the popes are infallible? Oh, if the Roman Catholics claim that the popes are infallible, how can they reconcile the contradictory decrees of Clement the Fourteenth suppressing the Jesuits, July 21st, 1773, and Pope Pius VII restoring them, August 7th, 1814? Now here you've got two popes giving contradictory decrees, but yet they're supposed to be infallible. Mm -hmm. um, it was almost indeed absolutely impossible for the church to enjoy a true and solid peace while this order of the Jesuits existed. That's what Pope Clement said. Uh, of course, uh, Pope Gregory uh, the, the 16th was, was the infallible when he condemned liberty of conscience, of opinion, and of the press. Mm -hmm. Let me interject on how they can do this, because this seems so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You read all the mistakes of all the popes, how they've contradicted one another, how they have uh, uh, agreed among themselves that previous decrees were invalid and so forth. How can they do this and with a straight face say that the Pope is infallible? The answer is they, they say the Pope is only infallible when it comes to matters of faith and morals. And uh -huh. when we say, well, wasn't this a matter of faith? They say, no. Well, was this a matter of morals? No. So the, the, they've, they've got you coming and going. They define what faith and morals means. So they can slip out of the so trap So they can slip time. out of the trap. So you could put posters up like this all day long and the Roman Catholic theologian would just sit there and say, we agree, this Pope was a scoundrel. This guy made a bad decision. They'll even say that Peter was wrong when he hid his ham sandwich behind his back. It just proves what a scoundrel he is. <sighs> but Peter was not speaking in terms of faith and morals when he did that. Uh -huh. And that's how they get around it. I and we see. say, well, what could be more pertaining to the faith other than the gospel itself? Exactly. And therein lies the tension, you see, with the Roman Catholics. And that's how they slip around these issues. Oh, for sure. Well, uh, unfortunately for our viewers, our time is just about up. I want to go, I'm going to have to skip several of these charts and go to the last one I just wanted to give for contemplation's sake. <laughs> Let me just move this back behind me here. Uh, we were reading those statements by the popes, mm. God, God on earth, and, and I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and so forth. With our time closing now, I would like to take our viewers to this last chart. 
Uh, maybe in another show in this series we can bring up some of these that we missed because mm. I we had a lot of good details there whether they slip out of or not. It's hard it's, to get it all in. in exactly, one hour. one hour it's almost impossible here. Mm. But uh, let's take a look, viewers, at Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses three, three, and four. The man of lawlessness. And uh, Rob, could you quickly, as we close the show now, uh, run through these? And uh, we'll, we'll sign off after you read these. You make your final statements, and Char that'll be it. Characteristics of the man of lawlessness. Now, for, for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, biblical Christian theologians were committed to the, the concept, and still are today, that the characteristics of the Roman pontiff, as he has this massive authority that he has usurped for himself, fall in uh, line, in many cases, with what is described as the man of lawlessness in Second Thess 2. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, and even sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Remember the quote by the Pope, I am the way, the truth, and the life, proclaiming himself to be the vicar of Christ on earth, proclaiming himself to be God. The coming of the lawless nun will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Believing the lie, that's what this program is all about. There are millions and millions who have believed this lie about the Pope and his authority, and they slavishly worship him. He goes to a country and the people jam the arenas and jam the highways and fall down and cry and worship and beg for a view of him and would do anything just to touch him and kiss him. This is Antichrist business right here. Christ never left us with that. And th Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear From You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -S -E -S -S in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at aol.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you 
And may the Lord bless you and yours. Thank you.